The second time you met, you came to debate with uh, uh, Professor Hoodboy. Yeah, that was yeah. a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that is an important uh, uh, part. Well, of the reason journey. it was a disaster, because I was in Islamabad, mm -hmm. and he agreed, and he gave us about four or five hours. Mm -hmm. So we had to jump into a car. I remember you read his book. I read his whole book in the car. <laughs> well, at least I went through substantial portions of the book. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with a lot of his narrative. So if you look at the online debate, mm -hmm. I'm agreeing with him, but mm -hmm. he's ignoring me mm -hmm. and he's dismissing me. Mm -hmm. And he was like belittling the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's very hard to even claim that he believes in the Qur'an. When I engaged in the secular studies, I realized that they have their own epistemological and metaphysical assumptions. Mm -hmm. There is no domain of knowledge that does not have any assumptions. Mm -hmm. None. Zero. Zero. Like none. And then when you look at the Islamic domain of thinking, of knowledge, its assumptions are grounded. We could prove them. We can show that they're intuitive. We can show that they, you know, they have a rational basis. And also they give us a sense of sakina, tranquility, and they satisfy the mind. But what's very interesting, the methodology of the Qur'an is this. When Allah refers to nature in the Qur'an, Allah gives you a conclusion. Mm -hmm. What we have done, we have ignored the conclusion that Allah wants to give us, mm -hmm. and we make our own conclusion up. Mm -hmm. Fine, it could be the secondary reading, but prime facey, meaning on the face of it, why are you ignoring the conclusion Allah has already given you? By the way, you need to be a much better host, yeah. Yeah, you I guess to, so. You better so stop me. I, I don't know you, how You're to dealing stop me. with someone who's had five shots of coffee. <laughs> you're dealing with someone who, you know, you have so, to say Hamza, chop. <laughs> yeah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, welcome to Youth Matters. Good afternoon. Uh, and assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessing up be upon you. <laughs> the method that Brother Hamza today uh, uses. Uh, today we have with us Brother Hamza, Hamza Zorsis. Uh, he's from, he's a British uh, writer, philosopher, researcher on Islam and topics related to that. And uh, furthermore, he uh, he's also involved with Sapiens Institute and formerly with IRA UK, the Dawa organization, as we know. Uh, the sapiens is much more uh, towards the academic side and as opposed to the IRA that is much more related to Dawa and international calling people towards Islam. Both are related and we'll discuss these things uh, in the future. So, Brother Hamza, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah <laughs> for giving me the opportunity and it's great being in Pakistan again. I just arrived just a few hours ago. Okay, so, welcome to Pakistan. <laughs> yes, so I'm a bit, a little bit tired, but I mm -hmm. think this coffee is going to kick in soon. Inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. You've been to Pakistan uh, several times, right? You've been Twice, here. yeah. Twice? Yes. I mean, I remember, uh, uh, the, the, when you met, you said you remember me. I don't know if you remember me or not, but the thing is we met back in uh, SIST event was uh, in Islamabad. Um, it was your first visit, I think. You were with the Adnan Rashid. Yes. And uh, we met there in the auditorium. It was your, your first talk here. I think it was, I think, back in 2012 or 2013. Do you remember the year? I don't remember the years, but I do remember I've been here twice. Yeah. Uh, twice before uh, now. Yes. I mean, so this is my third visit. Your third visit. Yeah. Okay. So both of your visits, prior visits, uh, I've met you on the, those. So my name, uh, my name is, <laughs> I forgot to mention. My name is Mohammad Hamas Ashraf, right? I am uh, I am um, associated with Youth Club Research and Development Department, uh, and also uh, I have a, a small diploma in uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, also, I have an MPhil in biotechnology and plant genomics. Uh, wow, these are my sciences. And I was I was also I am also inspired by the same things, right? My journey to Islam included uh, dealing with atheists as well. And uh, partially uh, back in that time, like 2009, 2010, we didn't have much data in regards to atheists. So whatever we had to take it, we have to take it from online. So that's how we started looking up and we found IRA and uh, your blogs and things of that sort. And we started co coordinating, uh, coordinating from back then. And the second time we met, you came to debate with uh, uh, Professor Hoodboy. Yeah, that was yeah. a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that is an important uh, uh, part. Of well, the journey. reason it was a disaster because I was in Islamabad mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And he agreed and he gave us about four or five hours. Mm -hmm. So we had to jump into a car. I remember you read his book. I read his whole book in the car. <laughs> well, at least I went through substantial portions of the book. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with a lot of his narrative. So if you look at the online debate, mm -hmm. I'm agreeing with him, but mm -hmm. he's ignoring me mm -hmm. and he's dismissing me. Mm -hmm. And he was like belittling the Quran. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's very hard to even claim that he believes in the Quran, to be honest. Yeah, it, it, Just by virtue of the way he was expressing himself. But mm -hmm. we leave that to Allah. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, that was me like a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I've changed since then. No, right? th that's so the thing. So I, 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 you know, looking back at those things, mm -hmm. there's probably a hundred things I would do differently. Yes. And but, it, but the reason I say it was a disaster is because he wasn't willing to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he went away and we were there. We were the part of the team that arranged uh, the thing. Yeah, uh, he, anyhow, he, he walked off. He, he walked off. Because I, I said he hates the Muslim world or something. Yes. Yeah, so the thing and is then, that... And uh, then he said shut up or something. Or, <laughs> and then he walked out. But yeah. so And then he lied about me after as well, which made it worse. <laughs> but anyway, it is what it is. But I think um, we have to understand that when we debate in the Islamic tradition, mm -hmm. we have to understand that when we do anything, we have to refer to the Qur'an and yes. the way of the Prophet Sallallahu mm Alaihi -hmm. Wasallam. And when it comes to da'wah, when you go to chapter 16, verse 125, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says to call to the way of Allah with hikmah, with wisdom. Mm -hmm. And when you think about wisdom, wisdom is the application of ilm. Mm -hmm. It's the application of knowledge, making knowledge relevant. Mm -hmm. So you have to know the context, mm -hmm. otherwise you won't have wisdom because yes. you can't apply knowledge mm -hmm. in a relevant way mm -hmm. unless you understand the context. Exactly. Now Allah says, and to preach to them in the best way, mm -hmm. right? With, with goodness, mm -hmm. hasana. Mm -hmm. And then Allah says, وَجَدِلْهُمْ mm -hmm. Which basically means, and debate with them, discuss with them in ways that are best, mm -hmm. okay? Now, linguistically and the Mufassireen, they discuss that the foundational default position, the primary approach in Dawah is to use hikmah and to have goodness. Mm -hmm. And that includes having ilm and that includes understanding the context and that includes having rahmah. Mm -hmm. And then Allah says, and debate with them in ways that are best. Now, there's a linguistic discussion, we don't have to get into it, but the point is, this shows that, by the way, hikmah and hasana are nouns, mm -hmm. right? And debating is a verb, yeah? Mm -hmm, yeah? So there's an interesting linguistic discussion here. Mm -hmm. And the discussion is essentially that the primary way of giving dawah is with hikmah and goodness, mm -hmm. and the debating is instrumental. Mm -hmm. You debate when necessary. Mm -hmm. If required, mm -hmm. once you understand the maslaha, the mafsada, the benefits and the harms. So, so, so it's no secondary. Mm -hmm. And there is, and if you decide to debate, there is a primary way of debating. I'll quote you three scol scholars. Mm -hmm. Ibn Kathir, mm -hmm. Imam al-Nasafi, mm -hmm. and Jamakh mm -hmm. Different theological backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And they all say the same thing, basically. So when you decide to debate, mm -hmm. it has to be with without any gruffness, no harshness, mm -hmm. in the best manner, with hikmah. Mm -hmm. I think Imam al nasafi says, you know, you awaken their hearts, right? Mm -hmm. So, that approach mm -hmm. wasn't really used by me a decade ago. <laughs> yeah, <that laughs> and, 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 I, and it's very important to highlight this because we need to follow what Allah says about these things and the primary way of giving da'wah, the default position, is hikmah mm -hmm. and goodness and good preaching mm -hmm. and if you're going to debate and, and debating is not the primary way of dawah mm -hmm. Razi, mm -hmm. Imam Razi, uh, Al Razi, he basically comments and says this shows linguistically because Allah mentions the two nouns then the verb that debating is, is not even part of dawah <laughs> so he says because dawah is about awakening the truth within people getting them to understand, win them over, getting them to understand Islam, their hearts are connected to Allah. Mm -hmm. Debating is about proving them wrong. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and removing falsehood. So he argues 
that debating here is not even part of da'wah. Anyway, the point is, um, when you decide to give da'wah, the primary way, so that when you decide to debate, the primary way of debating is with softness and, and, and with gentleness, without any gruffness or harshness, and to awaken something within people. And the reason I've mentioned this, because uh, we all have to adopt this in the da'wah, and it's also very important because it corrects many mistakes that we've made in the past. And this doesn't mean that there's no room for being assertive. Because mm -hmm. if you look at Musa alayhi salam, you know, he was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak layin and softly, kindly to Fir'aun, one of the worst creatures. Mm -hmm. Imam al-Qurtubi, he comments on this and he says, if Musa alayhi salam had to speak nicely to, to Pharaoh, Fir'aun, mm -hmm. then imagine how we must speak to anybody. Yes. Because you're not a Moses and the person you're speaking to is not a Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. But does Musa alayhi salam get more assertive? Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. But that's when the context changes. Mm -hmm. So your default position, your primary foundational position in da'wah is to be soft, kind, merciful, to have forbearance. Mm -hmm. And if you decide to debate mm -hmm. as an instrument, which is not a default way of, of da'wah, mm -hmm. but if you just decide to debate based on the maslaha, mafsada, the benefit and the harms, mm -hmm. the default way of even debating is softly, kindly, mm -hmm. awakening things within people, mm -hmm you know, inspiring them and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you're going to change from that and become more assertive, mm -hmm. it has to be based on a particular context mm -hmm. and you applying the principles from the Quran and the Sunnah in order for you to justify your change in strategy. Mm -hmm. What happens now these days, mm -hmm. not everybody, but generally speaking, mm -hmm. we've flipped the script. Mm -hmm. So we think debating is the primary form of da'wah, mm -hmm. not hikmah and good preaching. And we think that uh, when you debate, the default way of being in debating is to be harsh. Mm -hmm. So we've turned everything upside down. Yes, I wanted because to... Because it's all ego, bro. <laughs> Not That's my, what it is. My ego. No, 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 not <laughs> yours. I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, 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 mine, I mine. <laughs> <laughs> Our ego, it's a collective thing, isn't it? It's a collective malaise. All right, so uh, a part of the structure of this uh, uh, discussion... Yeah, sorry for going on too yeah, much. No, 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 it's fine. I'm that trying, is to, I'm trying that, to kick start the old that, engine. Th that is what we wanted to discuss already. I'm 42 now, man. So, you know, you have to get, you have to get warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that uh, the structure of this uh, podcast we were doing or discussion session... Yes was we didn't want to take it as a usual because everybody when you come or most of we know your story, you, we know what you've been through and whatnot. But the important part, uh, uh, elements that I wanted to highlight is exactly these things. Yes. For example, we've seen you when you changed, when you, before uh, in the early days, like 2010, 11, we saw we were like, we also evolved with you, our strategy as well. It was a thing, okay, we are going to, there were lots of debate, the Muslim debate initiative, where we, uh, uh, we have a discussion with Prof Professor Lawrence Krauss, yes. we had with somebody and this and that. that. And we saw that eventually it led that it changed the process and uh, the way of your dawah and the way of a lot of people's dawah changed over time. There was an element of how to sincerely take this approach to mm. dawah towards, uh, and we noticed that, right? Yes. And I wanted to discuss exactly this point with you, that what led, uh, what was your mission and purpose and vision back then, as opposed to right now? For example, how did it change in a way that, for example, if now you, you, we see that we are not, you're not directly engaging with as many people, yes. or we are not, you're on the back end now, much more academic side of the things, and well, and, yeah, and, I mean, and this process, what led this process, and it is important, I think, for the audience to know that there is a level of maturity that everybody achieves uh, in a way in, in their process and their journey. So what was your story in, of the change, the story of the change? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think uh, there's a few reasons, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's hard to retrospectively mm -hmm. connect the dots. Mm -hmm. But thinking aloud here, I think, and I have thought about this a little bit as well. One main reason is the more knowledge you gain, mm -hmm. the more it humbles you and the more you have to submit to the truth, Mm -hmm. and to the right way of being. Mm -hmm. So when you engage with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you engage with the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
it's going to show you the right way of being. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much you can do or so much you can take, meaning there's only so much you can not follow the Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Something's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel agitated. Mm -hmm. There's going to be this disconnect. There's going to be this... Um, so do you, in, internal do you feel agitation, was, uh, an agitation and disconnect when you were a lot of inside these debates or all these polemics. Do you think that was the case? No, I'm, I'm not necessarily. So I'll get into that. But I think prim primarily it, is, it was about aligning yourself with what you've learned now. So mm -hmm. if you learn new things about how to approach people, how to deal with people, how to engage with people mm -hmm. according to the Islamic way of life, mm -hmm. according to the Islamic principles, mm -hmm. according to the guidance that we derive from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam eventually if you have even an ounce of sincerity you're going to align yourself to that you'll have to otherwise you're going to be a walking contradiction you're going to be you're going to be agitated yeah mm -hmm. psychologically and spiritually agitated there's going to be a lot of friction yeah so that's one point the other point is when I was when I engaged in secular knowledge so I went into academia relatively late. So mm -hmm. in my mid-30s or early 30s, I did a postgraduate certificate in philosophy. Then I did a master's in philosophy. Then I did a master's in research in philosophy. And now I'm doing my PhD. Mm -hmm. When I was going through that, I realized, hold on a second. This is all nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> it's all bakwas, man. I am telling you. It is absolutely not. Like, especially you guys. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but... Sometimes we look at the academic West as, you know, they reached the pinnacle. I am telling you, it's total nonsense. Nonsense. I was in my master's class, for example, having advanced discussions in the seminar sessions. Mm -hmm. And I, the, I had like almost a eureka moment, which was they're so close yet so far. Like... And, it, and Allah blessed me by getting involved in academia a bit late when I was a little bit more grounded in Islam and in the aqidah of Islam. I was thinking about Allah's names and attributes. Mm -hmm. Every time they had to think about maybe epistemology or metaphysics, they just, all they needed was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Now you may think that sounds crude, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because the more you really understand Islam, you understand its intellectual foundations, you understand its spiritual foundations, you understand Allah, His creative agency, the fact that He's worthy of worship, His names and attributes, how they manifest themselves in the cosmos and so on and so forth. It's gonna, it's gonna align, it's gonna give you the correct lenses to understand yourself and understand reality. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so, so when I engaged in the secular studies, I realized that they have their own epistemological and metaphysical assumptions. Mm -hmm. There is no domain of knowledge that does not have any assumptions. Mm -hmm. None. Zero. Zero. Like none. And then when you look at the Islamic domain of thinking, of knowledge, its assumptions are grounded. We could prove them. We can show that they're intuitive. We can show that they, you know, they have a rational basis. And also they give us a sense of sakina, tranquility, and they satisfy the mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas the epistemological and metaphysical assumptions of a lot of, you know, secular philosophy, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, you have to either just adopt it for the sake of it, or you have to do a lot of work to try and justify it. Mm -hmm. They're not very intuitive, mm -hmm. right? Anyway, the point, and that's the difference between Quranic way of thinking and Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. Western philosophy, generally speaking, it has assumptions that are not generally intuitive sometimes and they, yet they have to do a lot of hard work in trying to justify them. Mm -hmm. But in the Quranic paradigm is, it, you, know, you don't even need mm -hmm. to start discussing some of the assumptions or mm -hmm. presuppositions that it brings to the table because they're intuitive, they're self-evident. And if someone denies a self-evident truth, the onus of proof is on them, not on you, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's just a crude summary. But the point I'm trying to say is when I got involved into secular academia, um, it, it also humbled me to a degree and I realized, hold on a second, mm -hmm. what are we trying to prove here? Mm -hmm. I mean, and what are we using to prove the Quran and the Sunnah? And, you know, like take the philosophy of the mind, for example. You know, if you, if you read a basic book on it, you may think, oh, I've got a great argument for God's existence and I'm going to develop this great argument. But when you get into the 
depths of it and you go into the nuances in Western philosophy, there's this, this is so much. I mean, how much are you going to cover? Mm -hmm. And there are so many different perspectives mm -hmm. and arguments and counter arguments and responses and, you know, specific premises or assumptions or principles or ideas within the realm of the philosophy of the mind are unpacked and they're discussed and there are pages and pages and volumes. And I'm thinking, subhanAllah, I mean, we're going to go through all of this just to try and, you know, justify our deen. Mm -hmm. This is nonsense because the academy, the Western academy is designed to make you a skeptic, right? Mm -hmm. So that itself helped me realign myself to a certain degree. And it was a humbling experience as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing was, you know, when you get older, hopefully you get more experiences and you learn. Mm -hmm. And through your experiences, you get humiliated as well. And mm -hmm. humiliation is one of the best things that can happen to a public speaker. I mean, it was very quite honorable to see that, for example, you wrote the article uh, on post-debate analysis of yours on Hood Boy's debate in your, on your website. Where you admitted that... Uh, yeah, I don't remember doing that, but yeah. <laughs> My memory is really bad, but I don't think it's there anymore. But yeah, I did write something, I think. Yes, you said yeah. that uh, we I mean, acknowledged that this was uh, not, not, not how it's supposed to happen. Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't have reacted that way. Mm -hmm. And um, and nor should, should have uh, mm -hmm. Professor Hoodboy. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to finish the yes, three yes, points yes. I wanted to make, mm -hmm. you know... When you go through these experiences and you, you get humiliated and you become hopefully more humble mm -hmm. and you realize, you know, as you get older, because of the consistency in the dawah, mm -hmm. you're either going to crumble or you're going to grow. Mm -hmm. And when you're consistent and persistent, then hopefully something happens and you grow. Allah blesses you and gives you this gift of growth in, mm -hmm. to a certain degree. Alhamdulillah. And then it, it's less about you. It's less about your ego. And I had some eureka moments or some profound moments when I was in I era. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was about thinking about developing others. Like, how long are we going to be around for? I mean, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people on YouTube today, they're going to be forgotten in 10 years. Mm -hmm. There'll be a new language and a new, st and a new style. Mm -hmm. they they'll be forgotten in 10, 20 years. So, uh, so who's next? I mean, who are we developing? Mm -hmm. What are we doing that's going to transcend these, you know, time-bound, culture-bound ways of dawah. So like, for example, look at the greatest thinkers that came from the uh, Asian subcontinent. You have uh, Sheikh Isra, Isra Ahmed. You have Maududi. Mm -hmm. You know, look at their works and their books. These works and books are still going to be around, and these YouTubers are going to be dead. Yes. Let's just be honest, right? Yes. I'm not saying it to belittle them, because... We're, they are needed and they have a very important role. Mm -hmm. But we also have to think about how we're going to transcend the culture-bound, time-bound aspects of the Dawah. We need to write books, we need to develop other people, we need to create new strategies or create institutions. Or Do you see my point? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, and, and that's very important because that shows you have an Akhira-centric mindset mm -hmm. and an Allah-centric mindset because you're asking yourself the question, what does Allah want from me? What is the best for Islam, right? And, so, and, and, and that means we have to have a vision, a global vision. And usually someone who has a lofty and global vision, that vision transcends their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't want my deeds to stop on my, in my grave, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people are going to watch my YouTube clips for the next, what, 20 years? Mm -hmm. And then that's it, khalas. There's going to be a new media, it'll be the metaverse. Mm -hmm. God knows what's going to be around, right? There's, who knows? So that, but if you write a book... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, or you develop other people, or you, you create organizations, institutions that end up in the next hundred years developing hundreds of thousands of du'at. Mm -hmm. That's a legacy, mm -hmm. and that's that's a sign of ikhlas as well. It's not just limited to you mm -hmm. and what you put out there for the next just few years. You see, so we need to have a vision. That's why vision is very important. So that leads me to the next uh, part of your journey. Is I mean, I understand the context now. And, I, and I, I, I believe this is also maybe the reason for your change in mission and purpose from IRA to Sapiens, for example. Is it linked to that or is it not? No, I mean, when I became, I was forced to become the CEO of IRA, by the way, yeah? All right. It, so, it was, I didn't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. Because this, the CEO at the time, he's like, look, I have to move on. 
you you just just yell. I think he said something like do istikhara yalla whatever right you got no choice kind of mm. thing it was framed as a choice but basically the subtext was there is no choice just do it mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing about having these type of experiences they build you mm -hmm. they they build you or they reveal you yeah mm -hmm. and i didn't want to be the type of leader that was you know that had such because you know when you get a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. you transcend your individuality now you think oh my god it's not it's not about me anymore it's about the global dawa it's about creating something it's about developing people and i had that before anyway just about one or two years before because mm -hmm. i had this moment in chicago where this brother just ripped into me saying what are you doing you think you're a superstar who are you developing think about the akhira it was a, it was and i came, went back to ayer and i started alhamdulillah, crying alhamdulillah. and then that um, that basically started the educational programs so a lot of them in i era mm -hmm. and those educational programs became the basis of my book mm -hmm. so that one moment actually just you know developed so many different things mm -hmm. and it changed my mindset i said every time i'm going to go somewhere i'm going to try and develop people it's mm -hmm. not just about giving a lecture and mm -hmm. you know this is not being a rock star here <laughs> anyway so um what was i saying <laughs> what was i saying about, previously about, about, you, about the book No, before that, mm -hmm. Ayera, yes. Ayera. So when I got that responsibility, mm -hmm. I felt okay. I, I, you know, I need to do something with this. And I had, alhamdulillah, I was blessed with good skills. I was a program consultant or project management consultant mm -hmm. before, back in the day. Mm -hmm. I used to work for the private and public sector. Mm -hmm. So I implemented some of these transferable skills, and alhamdulillah, we increased our operations by over a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. Our funds were over 500%. percent. It became like a proper global organization. Hamda, the previous CEO, did great work in terms of establishing a new strategy mm -hmm. and a new vision, mm -hmm. and I implemented that with the great work of the team, of course. And Hamda, we grew. Okay. Now, what was happening was in the three, just under three years, I was CEO. Mm -hmm. I really took a step back to to focus on the work because mm -hmm. that was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, focus on. The organization, the institution, the entity that's going to be a vehicle for a lot of global dawa. Mm -hmm. Now, Ayera at that time was doing a lot of dawa grassroots mm -hmm. in the developing world and in the West, but also it was also doing advanced stuff. Mm -hmm. So what happened was is the the board decided to change the strategy, which was the best thing to do, mm -hmm. and that's why they've grown even further mm -hmm. in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. They said, forget the advanced stuff. Focus on the basic stuff. Focus on the developing world. Mm -hmm. So if you focus on Africa and the Far East, you're going to get more shahadas, right? Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to start, you know, getting more reward. And you know we have to focus because focus leads to success. If mm -hmm. you want to do try and do everything, it's, you're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So when I left as a, a CEO. After about six months or something, the board said to me, uh, or they suggested, we're not doing this advanced stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. Why don't you take it? Do you so mean I the took advanced stuff by the more academic the side? The atheism stuff, the evolution stuff, mm -hmm. the liberalism stuff, the, the philosophy, whatnot, philosophy, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One, since Iris t had a strategy tweak, mm -hmm. the suggestion was, why don't you take that and build you, now your own organization? Mm -hmm. And that's what we did because we did a lot of great work in our era at that time. Mm -hmm. We trained the, the imams in America, imams mm -hmm. in America and mashayikh, imams and mashayikh in Canada, mm -hmm. imams and mashayikh in Europe. Mm -hmm. Like we became a name in developing big people, right? Mm -hmm. Not that we have ilm, mm -hmm. uh, they have the ilm, mm -hmm. but we had the experience and the tools mm -hmm. to translate their classical learning mm -hmm. And to apply it in a modern context, mm -hmm. so we had the ability to apply aqida in the contemporary context. Mm -hmm. So that's what we offered people, and that mm -hmm. was a that was a space that we occupied, and that was a gap that we filled. Mm -hmm. And to lose that would be a disaster, mm -hmm. because developing these imams, you're going to develop future du'at, you're going to develop future organizations. Mm -hmm. So then we developed the Sapiens Institute, which really its vision is about. You know, a world convinced by Islam, mm -hmm. right, or convinced of Islam, mm -hmm. and our main strategy is the the team itself to sh intellectually share and defend Islam, mm -hmm. but specifically, it's to empower, develop, and create others or create du'at, create, develop, and empower du'at Muslims to be able to share Islam academically, intellectually. 
And in that we also deal with shubahat, destructive doubts mm -hmm. And we build other individuals and organizations by helping them have a vision and a strategy mm -hmm. That's why I'm in Pakistan the main, one of the main reasons because of the visionaries. We, we, we're we're going to come to that yeah, as well. So, For example, so, what is your uh, this uh, uh, the program you're about to do, this workshop, the seminar? Yeah, so the what visionaries, your, yeah, okay. so the visionaries started with a conversation with me and Sheikh Hitham outside the Chinese embassy. <laughs> <laughs> so we were outside the Chinese embassy because as you know, what's happening, oh, China yeah. is yes. like a, an oppressive entity, you know, mm -hmm oppressing our brothers and sisters in China, the, the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. I know there is a political sensitivity in Pakistan about this because China has uh, colonized a lot of Pakistan. Um, but that's another discussion. Um, I've had debates or discussions online with some of uh, your fellow, fellow, uh, fellow, what brothers? do you call it? Fellow, no, not brothers. How do you call someone who's a state? Yeah, I want to call, yeah, you can call them nationalists if you want. Okay. Um, but yeah, so anyway, put that to aside. So I was conversing with Sheikh Haytham, and it was because of Sheikh Haytham's pressing me to get this done, because we felt there was a need in the dawah mm -hmm. to give people, to, to have some kind of leadership and give people a Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric vision for their lives and a strategy that is connected to that mm -hmm. in order for them to have successful dawah. Mm -hmm. And... And for us, it's it's a sense of huge reward as well because you know, you may see one organization doing great work. They may be getting a million shahadas a year. We want to be the people who inspire those organizations. Mm -hmm. So even from a fundraising point of view, we have a good strategy. Mm -hmm. If you want Sadaqah Jariya, then support mm -hmm. Sapiens because mm -hmm. we are in the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. You know, Don't focus on the one, two organizations doing great work. Mm -hmm. Focus on the vehicle, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's how we want to frame ourselves as well, yeah, from a PR perspective. But in reality, that's what we want to do as well. So we had this thing called the Visionaries, which is basically giving people, individuals and organizations, du'at and organizations, three main things. Number one, helping them to develop an Akhira-centric and Allah-centric lofty vision. That is how you see the world, right? And who you must be in order to achieve what you want to achieve with regards to how you see the world. And to develop a sense of, and, and to develop a strategy, a do. So the see, the be, and the do. How you see the world, who you must be individually, who the organization must become, what the organization must be as well, what it must become, and the do, the strategy that you have to implement in order to achieve that. Right, uh, So we want to give them a vision, a lofty vision and a strategy And we want to give them 14 key principles for success in the da'wah mm -hmm. So these principles are from the Qur'an and the Sunnah So things like thinking, things like hikmah, wisdom Things like love, compassion Things like courage, bravery Things like, you know, enroll, don't control mm -hmm. right? Mentoring, um, integrity so we have a whole range of key principles mm -hmm. for success in the da'wah. Mm -hmm. So we did that in Turkey, in Sepanja. Um, we It was fully booked. We had around people coming from about 15 countries. And it was, it was a huge success. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just a four-day retreat. Mm -hmm. It was also post-retreat webinars mm -hmm. and post-retreat one-to-ones with people to continue to develop their strategy and their vision. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about, you know, mm -hmm. you know, just making some noise and showing that you've got a great brand. And hopefully we want it to be as sincere as possible to take them on this journey and be dedicated to their success, right? So okay. vision, strategy, principles of success from the Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people are going to be creating new organizations now. Mm -hmm. We were part of the initial process to inspire them to have a vision that's aligned with Islam and Allah's pleasure, uh, inspire them to have a, a specific strategy that would lead to success, and instilled in them certain key principles for success which are from the Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to try and do as well. So that's that's what we're about in Pakistan. Uh, what, what we're doing it's a in Pakistan. Good Jariya for all of this stuff. Well, not just that. It's, that's <laughs> this is what the dawah needs yes. because sometimes mm -hmm. when we do dawah, we don't think about what the dawah needs. Mm -hmm. We think about how am I going to look good? <laughs> yes. Or what do I need? Or what do I want? Mm -hmm. But we always have to ask the question: What does the dawah need? Mm -hmm. And this is what we call, and we discuss this in the visionaries as well, which is a health check analysis. Like, what is healthy in the dawah? If something is healthy in the dawah, then 
support it, make dua for it. If it requires replication, replicate it. If it requires replication. If it doesn't, then support the great stuff that's happening, the healthy stuff. If something is unhealthy, then make it healthy. If, if something is missing, then fill the gap. We need to have this approach, this health check analysis approach, because it's a sign of ikhlas. Because you, you want Islam to be elevated, not you to be elevated. Exactly. You want the betterment of Islam, you want people to, you want Allah's word to be the highest. It's not gonna happen if you end up going to an Islamic institution and say, right, what's the easiest thing for me to look good? I'm gonna write a book about wudu. I know this is a crude example, but with all due respect, how many books are we going to write about wudu? Like, let's be honest. I mean, yani, how many madahib are there that we generally follow? Four, right? Yani, khalas. Okay, say five. That hal hadith as well, yeah? That's a, that's, a, that's a school as well. Has its own framework. All right, so... But do you see my point? Yeah, you see so the, the, point. But, but this is important because we have to, you know, elevate our thinking. And people who end up doing that is because they don't have a vision for themselves. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we just have a very individualistic understanding of the da'wah. Mm -hmm. We have to understand, how am I going to fill the space? Mm -hmm. What is unhealthy? What is healthy? What is missing? Mm -hmm. And then fit yourself in that. Mm -hmm. And do it for the sake of Allah. Right? Yes. How many books are there in English about atheism from a Muslim? Yeah, there were quite few. I mean, no, by a Muslim, Muslim, a book about atheism mm -hmm. by a Muslim grounded in the Islamic tradition. How many books are there in English? I've read one, the Mirage of Atheism. <laughs> yeah, the Divine Reality is about one or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this one is my point. Atheism. So, uh, one of the reasons that I wrote the book <laughs> is because there was a huge gap in the Dawah. Mm -hmm. I could have spent three years building a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I could have spent three years going around the world and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. I could have spent, I'm, I'm not saying I didn't do some of that stuff. I'm not saying I'm, I have full ikhlas. I'm not trying to claim that. I'm giving this as an example. Mm -hmm. But I said, no, this is, this is one of the most important things. I understand. I mean, you and then the book was written. It was, it, was, it, was tr it was translated in over 11 languages or something. Mm -hmm. It's been translated in Urdu as well, by the way. I don't know who's done it specifically. But I need to get a copy, yeah. yeah anyway, we have so a copy of that as well. In Urdu, yeah? In Urdu. It's, oh, perfect, I want to see it. It's a, I think it's an office. At okay, Mac perfect. Club. So anyway, the point I'm trying to say, Habibi, is we need to do things that elevate Islam, that is more closer to the pleasure of Allah. Mm -hmm. And that requires us to have that health check mindset. Mm -hmm. And really, behind all of that is a key question. What does Allah want from me in this specific context? Mm -hmm. Not what does my ego want, or what do I like, or how am I going to look good? Because that's the nature of the nafs, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I want to look good, I don't want to look bad. I want to impose, I don't want to be imposed upon. I want to, I'm right, I'm never wrong, yeah? Mm -hmm. To the degree that you give up the truth and you give up the right way of being. Mm -hmm. we, that, the Tao shouldn't be about that. Exactly. And then when you remove that, then you do the right thing for the sake of Allah that elevates Islam. Exactly. And for some people, it's not being on, in the front, it's being in the back. Exactly. For some people, it's, it's writing a book. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's spending 10 years somewhere mm -hmm. studying. For some people, it's developing others, not putting yourself in the front. Mm -hmm. Allah knows. But we have to have this thinking and these questions. Exactly. Otherwise, Islam is, and the Dawah is just going to be like, oh, I've got something to do. I'm just going to do another podcast or no offense. yeah, <laughs> Or I'm going to just go on YouTube. It might be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, not saying, don't, I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. But I'm saying adopt a particular spiritual methodology in order to understand what the right thing is. Which is asking yourself that fundamental question. What does Allah want from me in this specific context? What's more pleasing to Him? Yeah, Because there are many halals, right? Mm -hmm. But what is, what is the greater halal, right? Mm -hmm. That's the question we should be asking. Alright, so before we end the podcast, we'll... End uh, already? We just no, no, started. No, no. <laughs> before we end, I'm uh, saying we will move to the Q&A uh, session uh, shortly after. You could tell the coffee kicked in, yeah? <laughs> yeah, we can tell. <laughs> The, one of the questions I wanted to ask you regarding this is the is somehow related to one of the uh, problems you're working on. For example, your thesis, it's regarding the heart problem. 
of consciousness? No, no. Uh -huh. My PhD thesis is not on that. Uh, which one is it then? My PhD thesis is on the Quran. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so what were you dealing regarding the heart problem? You were doing something regarding I that? was, yeah. So I did that for my masters. All right. Yeah, so this is interesting, right? So I did the heart problem of consciousness or, or related to that mm -hmm. for my master's dissertation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I, after my master's, I did an MRES. Mm -hmm. And MRES is usually considered a little bit maybe more advanced than the master's because it's a research postgrad. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing a 10,000 mm -hmm. word dissertation, you do a 20,000 word dissertation. Mm -hmm. wow. So because I think at that time, in between I was managing IERA, then I transitioned to Sapiens or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. I had to do a dissertation. I'm like, what am I going to do a dissertation on? Mm -hmm. So originally, I wanted to get involved into consciousness. Mm -hmm. But then I felt, is that the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. What would be the right thing to do? What would fill a gap mm -hmm. in the da'wah? Mm -hmm. it, it's actually the Qur'an, mm -hmm. right? So because I did some background study and reading on this years ago, mm -hmm. since 2012 or 13, mm -hmm. and I've been thinking about this topic a lot, I suggested to my the academic supervisor I want to do this topic and the topic was basically is scripture scientific yeah mm -hmm. so understanding science and scripture so basically science and Islam and science and a philosophy of science yeah it, it, it was an it, it's a combination of different domains yeah mm -hmm. of knowledge mm -hmm. so my particular thesis for my <laughs> emirs was is scripture scientific mm -hmm. I think it was called a philosophical assessment of Quranic bold concordism, mm -hmm. which is Ijaz al ilmi. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. So Ijaz al ilmi is the view that you have scientific miracles in the mm -hmm. Quran, a view that I don't really adopt. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's, there's, more, there's more things we need to discuss, as there are more nuances that we need to unpack and unravel. And I think we should adopt the classical position, which is mm -hmm. far more profound, mm -hmm. and it shows the Quran is timeless. Yeah, <clears throat> but that's another discussion. So I learned a lot doing that dissertation, oh, and I expanded these ideas a little bit more. Now, when I suggested that to the academic supervisor, they said, "No, we don't have any specialists to do this." Yeah, mm -hmm. and to cut a long story short, because of com communication, mm -hmm. and I left it late. They said, "Too late. We have to do it." Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted this to be the basis for my PhD. Mm -hmm. Or it became the basis for my PhD. Mm -hmm. And then I was applying to do different PhDs, and then I applied to Cardiff. And then, you know, my name is on my passport, Andreas Tzorzis. So I applied. Lots of people were very interested. Edinburgh was very interested. Birmingham was very interested. But then when I emailed Cardiff, uh, the academic supervisor got back to me and said, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Whatever, he treated me as a Muslim mm -hmm. Although my name was like, you know mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I attended your debate in Cardiff with so-and-so years ago mm -hmm. And your essay on this topic that I wrote in 2013 or something mm -hmm. He was using for his one of his acad academic modules that he was teaching as reading <laughs> And that was a sign I had to do this PhD as well wow. So I, I joined the program in Cardiff mm -hmm. And my PhD <laughs> is on it's on basically the Quran. It's a theological and philosophical and maybe hermeneutical assessment mm -hmm. of Ijaz al ilmi mm -hmm. and the multiplicity of readings approach. Mm -hmm. So the whole PhD focuses on. So let me just quickly walk through it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I go through what the classical scholars said about the Quran and the natural world mm -hmm. and natural phenomena. Mm -hmm. What, 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 were the, what was their methodology? Mm -hmm. So not only do I go into the <coughs> Mufassireen, the, the classical scholars, mm -hmm. the exegetes who explain the Qur'an, but I also go to, for example, almost historical works, mm -hmm. books of history, mm -hmm. zo 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 zoological, how do you say it? Zo zoological? Zoological, yeah. Zoological works by, I forgot his name now. Subhanallah. Uh, in the early... Uh, uh, um, Three, uh, uh, the first three centuries of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. And what was what, 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 and to derive an approach that the classical scholars, not just the exegetes, those who explain the Quran, but those outside of the exegetical tradition, how did the early Muslims, the classical corpus, the classical scholars, how did they view 
the relationship between Quran and the empirical world and natural phenomena. Mm-hmm. And you get this amazing pattern. You get this almost amazing underlying consensus, right? Mm-hmm. And so I go through Razi, even Al-Ghazali, Suyuti, Ibn Kathir, so many, mm-hmm. just to derive uh, even Maturidi, mm-hmm. an early tafsir as well, Tabari. And you see this amazing perspective that they had, mm-hmm. which is not the perspective that we have on Ijaz al Ilmi. It actually transcends it. And I derive something called the multiplicity of readings approach, yeah, mm-hmm. which is the Quran is a multi layered text. So the Quranic verses referring to natural phenomena have layers of valid meaning within a particular scope. Mm-hmm. And each layer of valid meaning can make sense to people across time, mm-hmm. not only from an empirical perspective, but from a phenomenological perspective, a first person experience perspective, mm-hmm. from an ethical perspective, from a spiritual perspective. Mm-hmm. And so I talk about what the classical scholars, uh, the, their perspective was. Then I'll talk about the post classical scholars, mm-hmm. like Bukeo, mm-hmm. Dr. Zarkar Naik. Mm-hmm. Kawakibi, <clears throat> Malik bin Nabi. Basically, how it changed over time. Tantawi. Mm-hmm. So, I talk about the post classical scholars on how they understood mm-hmm. science in the Quran. Mm-hmm. And I unpack their All views. Of, mm-hmm. And it's very interesting because Ijaz al Ilmi was only a phenomenon that was actually, in my view, as a result of post colonial trauma. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the Western world be- was, you know, the religion of the white coats. The, they, had, they had material success, scientific success, mm-hmm. and these thinkers, a lot of them grounded mm-hmm. um, the sense of revival mm-hmm. because there are two groups of post-classical scholars understanding the Qur'an and science mm-hmm. in a positive way, mm-hmm. meaning that there should be, you know, there's the science in the Qur'an. One group were the reformists and the other group were the apologists, mm-hmm. meaning giving da'wah. Mm-hmm. Now, the reformists like Tantawi and Malik bin Nabi and Rida and others, they didn't really use it to show that the, that the Qur'an was a miracle to the non-Muslim world. Mm-hmm. They did it for the Muslims mm-hmm. and to get them to, to have a scientific understanding of the world, a scientific understanding of the Qur'an, to show that the Qur'an gives you, uh, is the foundation for that thinking because your revival mm-hmm. is going to be based upon this scientific way of, of thinking, yeah? Mm-hmm. Because they saw the West that it was successful mm-hmm. and, and uh, this is a very crude and, uh, uh, mm-hmm. summary, but there's more nuances, but th- they were the reformists. Mm-hmm. Then you had the apologists, the post-classical scholars, the apologists, like Bukeo and others, who basically used the Quran to show to the non-Muslims that it's a scientific, scientific book. Scientific not a scientific book, but scientifically miraculous, mm-hmm. yeah? Or some of the statements <coughs> have positive scientific knowledge, some of the ayat. Mm-hmm. So I go through that, then I go through criticisms. Mm-hmm. So I got about 10 key criticisms, mm-hmm. hermeneutical, philosophical, theological criticisms of that approach. Mm-hmm. And then I discuss the multiplicity of readings approach and how that's a timeless approach mm-hmm. that actually shows the Quran is timeless in my view. Mm-hmm. It's impossible it came from a 7th century uh, human being because the structure of the verses and the layers of meaning mm-hmm. and the ability to engage with different understandings across time, not mm-hmm. only from an empirical perspective, mm-hmm. but from a phenomenological perspective and from mm-hmm. a spiritual perspective and an ethical perspective mm-hmm. give you these lessons, is just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And within all of that, I spend a whole chapter discussing on the epistemic nature of the Qur'an. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? The epistemic nature of the Qur'anic verses referring to natural phenomena refer to when you look at the natural phenomena in the Qur'an, mm-hmm. Allah usually gives you a conclusion in the beginning, in the middle, or the end. Mm-hmm. I've gone through the whole Qur'an on this. Mm-hmm. I'm doing. Obviously, I need to do it in more detail, mm-hmm. but... You could go through, through the whole Qur'an and pick each verse that refers to nature. Mm-hmm. You will find what I call an epistemic goal, meaning a maqsad, an objective or a conclusion that Allah wants you to conclude. Mm-hmm. These conclusions are either about yourself, how you should relate to Allah, or about who Allah is. Mm-hmm. And it's usually about His unicity, His oneness, His worthy of worship, 
don't associate partners with him. You should glorify him. Mm-hmm. You should affirm his perfection. Mm-hmm. You should be in awe of him. You should be grateful to him. Mm-hmm. None of these conclusions are directly and specifically about this Quran is a scientific miracle. Mm-hmm. It's more about who Allah is mm-hmm. and how you should relate to him. Mm-hmm. So what's very interesting, the methodology of the Quran is this. When Allah refers to nature in the Quran, Allah gives you a conclusion. Mm-hmm. What we have done, we have ignored the conclusion that Allah wants to give us mm-hmm. and we make our own conclusion up. Mm-hmm. Fine, it could be the secondary reading, but prime facey, meaning on the face of it, why are you ignoring the conclusion Allah has already given you? Mm-hmm. The Lord of the heavens and the <laughs> earth is telling you what the conclusion is and you dismiss it because you have an inferiority complex. Mm-hmm. So what's very powerful, when Allah refers to nature, He gives you a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, Allah tells you what psychological and cognitive and spiritual state you have to be in, in order to reach these conclusions. He gives you about five states. The sa'ilin, those who ask questions. Yeah? Yatafakkarun, those who reflect. Yatadabbarun, those who ponder. Albab, those who have insight. The, and, and those taqilun, uh, yaqilun, those who use their intellect. Mm-hmm. So if you use your intellect, have insight, reflect, ponder, ask questions, you have that psychocognitive spiritual state. Mm-hmm. And if you're sincere, you're gonna and you reflect on these reference, the ayat they refer to nature. You re, you reflect on them. You're gonna conclude what Allah wants you to conclude. And what's interesting, Allah already gives you the conclusions. He tells you what state you have to be in, what cognitive spiritual state you have to be in. But Allah doesn't tell you how to conclude what Allah has concluded. Mm-hmm. Because Allah is trying to get you to think. It's like algebra, right? Sometimes in algebra you have x plus 2 is equal to 3. The conclusion is 3. You have 2. So what is x? Is 1. It's the same kind of method. Allah is teaching you how to think, to have a Quranic way of thinking. And we've lost that in our discourse. Mm -hmm. There's not one, I haven't seen one English video on this topic, not one book. And this is a key way of how Allah wants us to understand who He is and how we should relate to Him. But it's missing on our discourse because we have an inferiority complex. We're suffering from post-colonial trauma, in my Mm -hmm. view. The book of Allah is telling you here is what Allah is referring to us to nature within ourselves or within the macro, macro universe, the universe, within the micro universe, our own selves. And Allah is giving us certain conclusions either in the beginning, in the middle of the end, connected to these verses. We ignore these conclusions. The Lord of the heavens and the earth is telling us what to conclude and we just ignore them. And he's telling us what states we have to be in in order to reach those conclusions. And we don't even reflect the way Allah wants us to reflect. We, we, we look to the secondary or the tertiary meanings. I'm not saying it's wrong. It could be an approach for the da'wah. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong. But subhanAllah, have some adab. Mm-hmm. If I picked any book, an English book, yeah? Any book. Mm-hmm. And I read three paragraphs mm-hmm. of an author. And I deliberately ignored the conclusions the author wants to give me mm-hmm. and I assume the book on describing you know the functions of the muscles is really a poetic way of uh, describing I don't know some kind of mystical poetry mm-hmm. Yani, I'm going against the epistemic goal of the text mm-hmm. this is a vice this is this is not adab but we do this with the Quran mm-hmm. shame on us so that's my PhD in a nutshell <laughs> yes. There's more to it than that. And so, so, care for yeah. you know explaining it. So very good that you explained us uh, what you're going through and your journey and how are you going through. By the way, you need to be a much better host. Yeah. Yeah. You I guess to, so. You better so, stop me. I, I don't know. You, how you're to dealing stop me. with someone who's had five shots of coffee. <laughs> you're dealing with someone who you know. You have so, to say Hamza, chop. <laughs> yeah. That's what you have to say. And anyhow, so we're gonna open for the Q and A. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Of course. Mala bless you. Thank you.